Oh, here we are. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my little chats, Interpreting Tradition. You have lots of things there. Look at the, um, uh, the, the link below. As I said yesterday, I uh, started um, to chat a little bit about whatever comes to my mind. And I thought, I don't know whether this is going to work. Uh, but anyway, I, um, it seems that uh, people are watching it. So I'm going to continue for a little while. Um, I, I mentioned uh, a book by Dostoevsky yesterday, uh, The House of the Dead. And I'm just going to continue with Dostoevsky today, um, just one more time, with another book, a short story. I'm going to tell you two stories today. They both deal with the same theme, but they end up differently. Okay, first story. This is um, a short story by Dostoevsky. Okay, so he was writing in the 1860s, I think, this, this, this particular story. And you may read it, it's called um, An Unpleasant Predicament. It has had many translations. Uh, sometimes it's translated. The latest is a nasty business, but it, I prefer the older translations. They 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 carry something that newer English versions uh, seem to lack for me. But anyway, more modern language and so on. I prefer a little bit a little bit more old-fashioned language because it carries something of the time, as it were. Anyway, this is the story. Uh, it's an aristocrat, uh, a member of the gentry, imbued with the spirit of the age in Russia in the 1860s, and that is with uh, the ideas of the French Revolution, uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, okay, and he was one of those progressive liberals. Okay, so anything Russian was with old-fashioned peasants, serfs, and so on. No, no, he was, he was, uh, you know, one of those moderns, <laughs> as we call them. All right. Uh, so anyway, he um, he believes in equality for all. Oh yes, and uh, he uh, is going to a party this particular night. And he's not his driver, but the the uh, the um, well the driver of the carriage <laughs> uh, asks him that day if he could have a few hours off because his cousin somewhere is getting married and so on. And he says, uh, "Well, of course not. No, uh, I am expected at this uh, gathering of people and so on." So he says, "No, no, he can't go." Um, so he goes to this party, this get-together of uh, excellencies and aristocrats and so on. He gets a little bit drunk, he decides to go back home and he finds that the carriage is not there. Um, it's a long story. Uh, he didn't actually go to the wedding that he hadn't been allowed to go, the, uh, the, uh, the driver, but, but um, he's not there. And so his immediate reaction is, how can he not be here? He obviously disobeyed me. How many lashes is that? A hundred? A hundred and fifty? That is his immediate reaction, you see. Um, even though he believes in egalité. Anyway, so he decides to walk. It's a fine night and uh, he doesn't live very far anyway, so he decides to walk home. As he's walking, he hears from somewhere not far away, uh, music and people dancing and laughing and enjoying themselves and so on. And he asks a, a, a policeman there who, what is happening there and says, oh, it's so-and-so, he's getting married today. And he says, oh, so-and-so, um, I he remembers the name, he, he knows that he works in his department, in his building. He is uh, a porter or someone like that, a low, lower um, person in the scale of things, but he does remember the name. He says, 
Yeah, well, perhaps I'll go in and congratulate him because after all, even though I'm an aristocrat, I believe in egalité. <laughs> and I will just go there and show them that uh, I uh, am one of them. Okay, so he walks in, everyone stops, the music stops, the dancing stops, and he walks in nevertheless with this um, gravitas, <laughs> you know, with his cane and so on, and that just, that's just to show them that he believes that they are his equals. I believe in uh, fraternité. Where is my chair? <laughs> um, so anyway, they all they're all uncomfortable. They don't know how to deal with his excellence here. What do they do? You know, so they give him a chair. The old woman, the mother of the groom, brings something from the kitchen quickly. Everyone is fussing around and so on. He goes. The mother says to the groom. Um, uh, we have to give him something to drink. Uh, uh, give him this vodka. And, uh, oh, you don't give vodka to his excellency. They don't drink vodka. They they drink uh, um, other things. They drink um, well. What do they drink then? They well, they drink um, champagne from France. Oh, what is that? Well, it's a drink. And uh, how do you get that? Well, you buy it in a shop. Well, where 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 do you buy <laughs> champagne? What is that? You know. So, and how much does it cost? Anyway, they decided to send one of the boys there to buy this champagne. Um, it's, it costs a lot of money. He has to plead, he has to beg the shop owner. He puts it on the tap for them. It's going to take months for them to be able to repay that bottle of champagne. Nevertheless, there he's, he goes back and he gives him a glass of champagne. Oh, champagne, very good. And he's drinking, totally unaware of the chaos that he is causing the lower classes. All right. So, uh, and then he, he sits there. And where is the bride? You know, they bring him the bride. Oh, congratulations. So he's there thoroughly enjoying his sense of superiority. Yeah. So anyway, he finally he, he gets up to, to go home and he's so drunk that he falls flat on the floor. This is the story, okay? He falls flat and he passes out, basically. So that's another drama. What do you do? What do we do? What do we do? Well, let's take him to his carriage. No, there is no carriage. He was walking, so so what do we do? So and the old woman says, Well, he'll just have to stay here tonight and um, and then he can go tomorrow morning to his home. Well, there is one problem, and that is that there is only one good bed in the house, okay? And that bed was specially made up with special linens and everything um, for the, uh, for the uh, couple, for the, for, the, for the young bride and groom who, who, who got married that day. So they have to give up that bed, that special bed, to his ex excellency to 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 sleep in where does the bride and the groom uh sleep well they have to make up a sort of a, a bed uh but uh, you don't want um, a newly married couple to sleep on the floor so um they they make up a bed of uh, tables low tables and uh, and um, put a mattress there and just to make it sort of look more like a bed. I mean, it's absolute chaos the way he describes it. And uh, okay, so everyone is in their beds now. And an hour into the night, there is a huge bang and noise and everything. And the married couple fell off the bed which was <laughs> a mattress on top of tables and they just fell down to the ground. So everyone comes rushing in. They're terribly embarrassed. The bride doesn't want to say anything. She's looking down. She's embarrassed. Uh, she just runs out of the house. She doesn't want to deal with it. And the poor groom is there looking down, embarrassed, a little bit ashamed, and so on. All right. Another drama. The other drama is that His Excellency is in his bed, in the good bed, 
but he's continuously vomiting and throwing up and needing to go to the bathroom and the old woman spends the whole night tending to him, cleaning up and all that sort of thing. In the morning, he gets up, he has an idea that perhaps he got drunk, that perhaps um, he passed out. He's a little bit embarrassed, but he's not going to apologize to anybody. He just gets up and uh, says, well, uh, thank you very much, and walks off. As he is walking home, he's thinking, now something happened here. I might have embarrassed myself. That means that the groom, this young guy, I'll have to get rid of him because he saw me drunk. And I don't want to have to look at him every day as I come in or go out of the building to remind me of this. So I have to get rid of him. The groom, at the same time, is thinking, I know I'm going to lose my job because he'll probably get rid of me, so I'll better ask for a transfer immediately. A week after, his Excellency says, so uh, so where is so-and-so? Oh, he's asked for a transfer to another town. Oh, good. Okay. So now he's pleased he hasn't, he doesn't have to deal with that situation. And the groom had to move to another town. They didn't have any money. They had to borrow money to move the few pieces of furniture and so on. You get the story. Dostoevsky's point here is that this um, perhaps hypocrisy, he's, he's dealing with the hypocrisy of the wealthy, um, when they say, oh, yes, of course, we're equal, my dear. Okay. And they are totally unaware. He was totally unaware of the suffering that he had imposed on people who were just there celebrating the wedding, singing and dancing and happy, and the chaos he brought because of his self-love, because of his I believe in equality kind of thing. You get the idea. Okay. Uh, so Dostoevsky is trying to, to remind us of, as I said, of the hypocrisy of those who in theory believe this, in practice, they, must, they, they might cause suffering to those more vulnerable. And this is the point, that they are not aware of it, that their virtue may cause suffering in others and they're not aware of it. When I was reading this story, and this is my second story, when I was reading this story, it brought to mind something that happened to me when I was a child. I hadn't thought about it, it was at the back of my mind, it, it wasn't that it was there or that, that I was thinking about it, but, but it, it, it took me back immediately, reminded me of this incident. Um, I was about, I don't know, eight, something like that. And um, as I told you, it was an orphanage, okay? So one day this nun said that these wonderful girls from the Sacred Heart School were coming to visit us. Sacred Heart was perhaps the most, the wealthiest, it was for the uh, private school for wealthy kids and so on. Um, and uh, she said that they were coming to visit us and they were coming to, um, to sing and dance for us. And we thought, oh, okay. <laughs> all right. So we were, we were all taken to this room and we all sat down and these beautiful girls came in with guitars and everything. And they looked so different to us. It was the first time that I had seen I had seen people looking so different to to us. Um, they all had uh, different different clothes. I I had never experienced 
people having different clothes. I had never seen it. So that was an eye opener. And they all had, uh, oh, they, they were all much taller than we were. They all look much more beautiful, for sure. And they had long hair, short hair, different, you know, their hair like this. <laughs> Blonde hair. And, uh, we had never seen anything like that. They look very different. And we were looking at them in awe, sort of, my goodness. And then they brought their guitars and they started singing for us. Da -da -da. And we were all there listening. <laughs> and then the nuns said, oh, and uh, after they finished singing song, songs for us, uh, the nuns said, sister said, um, and they brought some uh, biscuits, some cookies for all of us. And they had all these wonderful uh, boxes. And uh, sister went around just for us to pick one or two biscuits from the box you know and she went around everybody and we were all and it was i i don't know whether it was the first time that we had biscuits but um i think it was because i remember with my mind's eye i remember the reaction of the girls um eating the biscuits and, mm, ooh. <laughs> and we couldn't have had biscuits many, many times. So anyway, so the sister was uh, taking the biscuits around. And, uh, and then she came to me. And I said, no, thank you. Go on, take one, take it. And I said, no. And sister looked at me and I looked at sister. I couldn't quite, if she asked me for an explanation, I wouldn't have been able to give it, but I just felt something that forced me to say no for some reason. And then she, she looked at me and then she didn't, she didn't insist. She, she just went ahead with the other girls. All right. So why did I say no? I know what you're thinking. You think it was out of pride, right? That I was too proud to say. I can absolutely assure you that it was not pride. And this is my point because I remember it. Okay, it was not, mm, no, no. It was that I felt, I felt a little bit offended by it. I felt, Ah, uh, how can I explain it? Um, it was it wasn't a question of pride. It was more a question of dignity. Because how now the, my explanation now is that however sort of low you are down the ladder and so on, you you retain a certain dignity, and if that is taken away. You're still a human being and you still feel that hurt, you know. Um, it was not pride. It was that I felt that my dignity as a human being, I wouldn't have been able to put it in these words, but I, I, that is what it was. Anyway, so that was that. And then... Um, Sisters said, okay, well, they know how to play handball. We, we used to play a game. It was like handball, something like that. And they could play too. So um, would they agree, she asked them, to play a game with us? Yes, yes. So we had two teams and we started playing ball. And we were really good because we we were tomboys. We would fall down, scrape our knees. It didn't matter. I mean, we just got up and kept running, you know. But these girls were, <laughs> they were really bad at it, okay? They were, um, it looked as if they were uh, running, wearing high heels or something. I'm sure they were not wearing high heels. I don't remember. But but they couldn't run. They couldn't run. They, the ball would come, ooh. 
this is the point that they were losing so badly that one of the girls I, I, I was playing in the team because I was I was always very short and I could run very fast and get the ball and so on and she called us all the captain of the team and said look um, why don't we pretend to lose why don't we just make them uh, win the game after all you know they came here they sang a song for us with the guitars and they brought us uh, biscuits and so on why don't we just um, kind of let them win and we said yeah 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 so we let them win and they won and this is my point the only possible thing and that is why it ends differently from the other story the only thing playing ball in which we could say that we were better than they were we gave it to them we let them win that was the only thing that we had and we let them have it and my point is that they gave us what do I want to say crumbs they they gave us whatever they could spare without change any change to them and we gave them the only thing we had that's that's the story my my what i want to say is that sometimes when you go with the best of intentions i'm sure that they had the best of intentions I'm sure that they didn't cross their mind to to offend us in any way. It's not it's not a resentment of any kind. I, I but sometimes when we want to help others who are in a more vulnerable position than we are, perhaps it would be better for you when you're about to do that with the best intention in the world instead of thinking about you and you doing an act of virtue doing something good instead of keeping your eyes on yourself on how you feel consider the consequence or the effect that it might have on the other because Charity is different from pity, you see. Charity, love, which is based on our idea of God, we have God there and so we love others or share our love. That is, that is different from pity in which consciously or unconsciously there is a sense of you up here and the other person down there and so you throw a few crumbs now if you are hungry enough you will get those crumbs and say thank you uh, if you're not at the point of starvation you might offend their dignity a little bit I don't know that I have explained this. These are, you know, I'm I'm talking to you as things come to to my mind. But um, think about it. You will come to your own conclusions. But you know, funny enough, um, I've come uh, across a um, a quote from uh, this is Balzac, the uh, the French writer, and uh, he's talking a little bit about the same thing, and he says. I have often observed that while a charitable act may do no harm to the benefactor, it is death to the one who receives it. And I would change and say instead of a charitable, because we use the word charity sometimes to just mean, uh, to just to to mean um, an act of sharing. But the word charity is different in a way from just ordinary love. 
in that you focus your love on the other, not on yourself. So I would change that word charitable to uh, pity. So although it may do no harm to the benefactor, and it may even make you feel good, it might be death to the one who receives it. So always think about it and take into account not you, but the situation of the other to whom you're giving a few crumbs. That's it for today. Thank you. Bye-bye.